Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at how to fly the Icon A5 in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. The A5 represents our only float slash amphibian plane of all of Flight Simulator. Let's go ahead and take a look. The first thing we notice, I'll pop it inside this uh, small aircraft, is the fact that everything in here will remind you a lot more about a car than it will remind you probably about an airplane. I'm noticing that we have a small little kind of container back in the place where we can throw ahead some of our bags. I'm also noticing the fact that this aircraft has very, very high doors, which you kind of need so when you are in water, you don't open the door and flood the plane. And you also notice that the instrumentation reminds you more of something that came off of a car versus something that probably came out as an airplane. You also notice that as far as precision instrumentation goes, and notice our altitude indicator doesn't have a hundreds foot. Notice we have an AOA indicator, lift reserve indicators, which you hear this called. Notice a lot of our needles remind you of something that probably came off of a Porsche. Like I said, it's a little bit different. We do have a nice digital display in the middle, which is uh, super duper handy for us. We'll take a look at that in a bit. And we also, of course, have everything else we're going to need as far as the operation of the plane. Notice we have these big flat waterproof switches that we can use to go ahead and do things like turning on our nav lights. We also even have a little switch down here that turns on our water rusher, which is a little interesting. And we'll take a look at that a little later on today. Now, when this aircraft was originally designed, it was designed to basically be a light sport aircraft that basically replaced your snowmobile during the warmer months. The whole concept here was that we could build almost like a little like, sports car, almost like a dirt bike or a motorcycle that we could pretty much take anywhere we want to. It's not the world's fastest aircraft, as you'll see, and um, of course, it's got some other little quirks. We'll take a look at those kind of as they come in. So first things first, let's go ahead and get this thing started. All right, the first thing we're going to do to go ahead and get this aircraft started is we're going to come down here to the master switch. Starting this thing, super simple. We're just going to click on the battery master. As soon as we do that, we're going to get a bunch of angry warning lights basically all around one side and the other. You can see our fuels come to light. You can see we have a couple very, very simple little indications. We can test everything if we needed to. Notice the presence of red lights on anything that's not going to be working correctly. Next thing you know, we want to go ahead and make sure our altitude has been uh, pre-calibrated. We're sitting here, by the way, at Ocean City Municipal Airport. This is a pretty handy little airport for us because it's going to give us the ability to really take a look at some neat little details, especially water landings, which we'll do a little later on. Normally, what you'd want to do, of course, is to make sure your transponders in good shape. You want to double check to make sure your landing gear handles out of town. We're then going to go ahead and turn on our navigation as well as our strobe lights to kind of give everyone around us a quick little hey heads up we're about to get this aircraft started. You do not want to get too close to us. Now if we look directly above our heads there's a bunch of handy switches. First of all notice the presence of a caps parachute but more importantly notice the presence of this handy dandy switch that says the word fuel on it. If you forget to click this switch you're going to get a little annoyed. Now you're probably wondering what this little handle is about. Now believe it or not, this aircraft was designed to be trailered. So what you can actually do, and you can see the seam really, really clearly, is you can actually disconnect the wing and basically fold it up in order to take up less room. This is also super handy if you're trying to approach something like a nice tall dock that's going to get in your way when you actually land the plane. But we're going to go ahead and flip on the fuel onto the on position. Starting this thing, since it's very, very small little Rotax engine, isn't too difficult. We're simply going to reach over here. We're going to go ahead and crank this all the way to the both position and then crank it to start and wait just a moment for the engine to go ahead and catch. That's it. There's really nothing else sophisticated about getting this aircraft started. Now, because we're an amphibious aircraft, you're going to notice that it is a pusher style propeller situation. The propeller actually is sitting here behind us as opposed to in front of us. That's going to help keep it out of the water. All right, let's go ahead and get this thing rolling. So first things first, I'm just going to take a quick look around. As usual, we're going to be chopping up our little buddy there with a the little tug because uh, he's in our way anyway. I'm just kind of kind of wave at him. Hey, how you doing? Release the parking brake. I'm going to go ahead and give it just a teeny tiny bit of power, and we're just going to get this thing rolling directly. Now, some things you want to watch out for on the ground with this particular aircraft is you are a little on the wide side. So, dunk, <laughs> Take that. That's what you get for not servicing my airplane. You're going to notice it's a little on the wide side, so you want to kind of be careful with it. Even though it's this little tiny thing, you'd be really surprised how easy it is to clip stuff. All right, let's go ahead and get ourselves over to the taxi line. We're going to take our first left and go ahead and take our first right. Based on the POH of this aircraft, you're going to be taking off using full throttle as well as a single notch of flaps. So if I actually look down, I'm going to go ahead and go click and set it to the flaps 15 position. Next thing I want to do is you're going to set your trim so that it's good for takeoff. Right now you can see our trim is a little on the upside. The set takeoff trim, you're just going to go ahead and press your trim button until it goes all the way down to the letters T and O. Now the neat thing with this particular aircraft is that's going to give us a little bit heavier 
heavier controls for our takeoff purposes. That's actually a good thing for us because this aircraft does take a little while to get going. Now, during this video today, we are going to be doing water landings as well as conventional landings so that you can get a feel for the differences. There's a lot of things that are very, very similar. While we're rolling along the runway though, one thing I do want to do is I'm going to go ahead and flip this button over here for 3D vision. This aircraft does have built-in 3D vision, which is super duper handy because it gives us a more accurate reading of our altitude at any given time. And that, of course, can be wonderfully helpful. You can always switch it back to map mode if you need to in a minute. All right, approach is clear. We're gonna go ahead and activate our transponder to altitude mode. And we are good to go. Perfect. A Little bit of break. Taking this aircraft off, this is not exactly what I consider to be a short takeoff and landing. Any amphibious aircraft is gonna to struggle to get going. So I'm gonna go ahead and hold the brakes all the way down, press the throttle all the way to the forward position, wait for the thing to crouch a little, release the brake. Yeah, that's about as fast as this thing goes. It's not exactly what I consider to be a uh, fancy performer or anything along those lines. Notice our airspeed scug takes a little while to get going. And yes, my parking brake is off. <laughs> the good news for us is we can start pulling up on the thing once we get to about 45 or so. 45, we're gonna go give it a gentle little tug. You don't wanna pull back too hard or you're gonna end up smacking the tail. And that's all there is to it. Once we get airborne, of course, you're gonna to wanna to slap up the landing gear. You want to get your speed to right around 75 knots, and then you can go ahead and bring up that first notch of flaps you deployed. Once you feel you're just a little bit high enough that when you kill that notch of flaps, it's not going to suddenly dump you. Notice, by the way, when I pull them back on the controls, you can see my little lift reserve decreasing. If I actually pull back hard, you can see exactly what it does. It's a neat little trick, and I'll show you how to land with that. Okay, so here we are in beautiful, this is uh, right outside of Ocean City, basically Ocean Pines. This is a great little vacation spot for those folks who are pretty much on the entire eastern seaboard here. I visited this spot quite a few times myself. I've never actually flown into this airport, which is kind of a bummer. Someday I'd like to do so because uh, mind the, of course, uh, terrible thunderstorms you get in the afternoon. So we're gonna go ahead and swing around here. We're gonna go ahead and land in the Assa Woman Bay. Yes, that's actually the name of it. I didn't. I don't name these things. <laughs> but we'll also go ahead and take off from there so you can see kind of some of the quirks. This aircraft climbs best at right around 85, 75 knots, which is very similar to that flap up position. But again, I'm doing a pretty complex turn here, so I don't wanna get going too, too aggressively here. And you can see the actual proper Ocean City right there on my left. And you can, of course you can see the airport that we just went zipping by. I'm trying not to get too much altitude here, like I said, because I wanna land this plane in a few moments as well. Okay, so as far as this aircraft goes, the big thing with this one that you have to keep in mind is you've got that little tiny Rotax engine in the back. Now, if I were to level this aircraft off really gently like this and just kind of let it go, you're gonna notice my RPM is gonna slowly hike up into the red zone. To compensate for that, you're just gonna pull back on the throttle a little bit to keep the engine always in the green arc. Normally, when you're climbing very, very aggressively, you're never going to get into the yellow arc, so you don't have to worry about it. That's about as much as the POH recommends for cruise settings. It also says, if you're doing a mild cruise to actually set your cruise based on speed versus by, based on rpm which i thought was absolutely wild you know they say a nice relaxing cruise would be something like 90 knots so that's going to end up being about 5,000 rpm for us if you're looking for an incredible economy cruise i can go ahead and back this thing all the way down to 4,500 rpm which is barely turning over level the plane off and get going there are no mixture controls anywhere to be seen on this particular aircraft. It's just not designed for that. This thing is supposed to replace your snowmobile. So if you think about it from that perspective, think about all the kind of fun little aggressive stuff that people are probably gonna try. Now, if you want an interesting history, if you actually read a little bit about how this aircraft was designed and some of the procedures that the company's actually put in place, at one point they were actually going to be installing a little camera on board so they could monitor what the pilots were doing with it. Because again, they're thinking that you're gonna have like your rough and tough sporting type is gonna be riding this thing around aggressively. So you could probably imagine what they're thinking from an insurance perspective. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and try landing this thing. Again, I'm trying to keep the video nice and short today so that you guys can do more time flying instead of listening to me. Landing this thing is a little different. Now, unfortunately, in the little time I have in float planes in the real world, I never really had a chance to try it myself, but I can kind of walk you through what it's going to be like. First thing you wanna do as always is you're gonna to wanna to reduce your speed significantly. Once you get into the white arc, which is about 75 knots, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and deploy your first notch of flaps. Big mistake, by the way, is don't put your water rudder into the water yet. Now your approach speed for this aircraft, depending on your load, generally is gonna be right around 55 to 60 knots. And again, I'll show you a really slick trick. We're getting under 60, I'll go ahead and slap the last notch of flaps down. Confirm that your landing gear is in the water position. You wanna make sure that's true. 
Okay, so whenever you're landing in water, you always have to remember that you'll never be able to accurately judge the altitude that you're traveling over the water. It creates a massive optical illusion, which is very, very tricky to defeat in your head. Trust me, no matter how good you think you are, you're never really going to know how close you are. First thing I want to do is I want to try to confirm visually which direction the wind is coming from. In this case, I can tell you the wind is coming directly from my left. So I'm going to go ahead and bring myself around nice and gently. Again, I'm coming down very, very smoothly here. We don't have a feet per minute gauge. You just kind of have to do a little by feel which is very unique and you can see how they try to cram as many hotels as possible there fortunately i don't think we can see the ferris wheel eh, i didn't think so okay i'm gonna go ahead and bring us around now you want to get yourself going right around 55 60 knots and the idea here is to treat this like a carrier landing fly the plane down to the water don't sit there going oh i'm going to try to do a gentle flare no you actually want to stick this thing into the water as flat as you possibly can all right just kind of aim into the water all right, get, now we're getting a little fast here. Get, okay, nice and close. And you're just going to sit here. And when you feel a giant splash, resist the urge to push the nose forward. You'll porpoise. If anything, what you want to do is you want to just let it go. Boom, boom, there it is. So that first bounce, just pull the nose back just a teeny tiny bit. Now, in my real experience with these aircraft, the moment you hit the water, the nose goes whoosh and basically ducks straight down, no matter how carefully you do this. And now we're on the water. Now, these aircraft are built in such a way that you basically have two different places of flotation. You have like the main body, and then you have the rest of the body called the step. When you first hit that water, you're going to be riding on a teeny, teeny, tiny little hydrofoil, basically. And as you start catching more and more water, you're going to gently sink the tail into the water until you're completely in. Okay, we're here. Now that we're going less than 30 knots, I can go ahead and engage the water rudder, which takes just a moment. I'm gonna bring my flaps up to the 15 degree position. Now that you've done that, you can actually look out the back and you can see this teeny tiny little rudder that I can now kick around in order to drive around in the water. So uh, normally this water is tremendously shallow. I'm talking four or five feet deep. That's about a meter or so. So you have to be really, really careful. You can see how you've got the nice elastic over here and everything like that, just kind of chilling. Now, of course, we can enjoy the sights, but we're here to learn how to go ahead and get this plane back out of the water. First thing you want to do is you want to give yourself as much room as possible, and you want to point back into the wind. Give it just a teeny tiny little bit. It looks pretty good right there. Remember, there's no brakes. Next thing you're going to want to do is you want to make sure you have 15 degrees of flaps. You're going to want to go ahead and retract the water rudder. Now, you can hold the brakes all you want, and nothing is going to happen here. That's just the way this aircraft is. What I am going to do, however, is I'm going to push my throttle all the way forward and pull back on the controls. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get this aircraft to ride up. See how it's starting to lift the nose out of the water? And you're trying to ride just on the teeny tiny little part in the back. See, I'm starting to get almost like a jet ski kind of thing going on. And once you do that, see how the plane lifts up out of the water? You're going to want to hold it right in this position until it breaks free of the water. You're going to get this little kind of da da And all of a sudden, you're just going to gently release the controls and you're going to come up off of that spot that you were just in the water moments ago. Again, all you're trying to do is ride on just a teeny tiny bit of the plane called, called riding on the step, and then you're going to want to transition gently into the air from that position. Don't pull back any harder because you end up basically digging the tail into the water. And don't push forward because you're going to end up going boing, 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 boing across the water, and that could be really messy and increase the length of your takeoff. Okay, now that you've seen a water landing and a water takeoff, let's go ahead and get ourselves back over to Ocean City Municipal and try to put this thing on the ground conventionally. Now, I'm not a fan of landing this aircraft conventionally. The reason I'm not a very big fan of it is on account of the fact that this particular aircraft does not have the strongest landing gear because, again, you're either a good airplane or you're a good boat. You can't be both at the same time. That's just kind of how these things go. I'm going to go ahead and bring myself back around, just confirming my navigation information is correct. Again, I'm trying to keep myself under 1,000 feet. This isn't really the kind of aircraft I'm going to be going, oh, let's do a dramatic IFR flight. Oh, you can see that pretty grumpy looking cloud there. All right, make sure it flaps in the right position. Most common mistake people make is they leave the water rudder down when you try to land on something nice and hard. So kind of keep that in the back. That's about a thousand feet or so. You can see our little handy dandy airport straight ahead. Now, remember, we took off. We were, the wind was coming to our right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and cross the center of the field, take a left downwind, another left, and another left, and put us down on the runway nice and softly. It is very tempting to go ahead and land direct there, but we're not going to today because we don't need to. Go ahead and reduce my RPM a little bit. Remember, you're trying to keep it in the green, but again, the POH makes other recommendations. Generally, as long as you're not in the yellow, you're not going to do any damage to the plane. One thing I do want to mention, though, is the fact that it says right here on the side, your maneuvering speed is 76 knots. That means if you're going faster than 76 knots, which conveniently is this white line, that means any sudden maneuvers could potentially badly damage this aircraft. 
you want to be very careful about operating at those kinds of speeds. Again, it's all in kind of what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to do, but this is not exactly that powerful of an airplane. All right, there is our beautiful runway right there. Again, traffic altitude, at pattern altitude is right around 1,000 feet around here because, again, we're pretty much at sea level. Notice, though, we lack that vertical speed indicator, which makes it very difficult to identify exactly how fast you're going up or down. That's one of the reasons why I like switching to 3D vision mode because it gives you that ability to actually see everything. You can get a really much, much better idea of both how high you are as well as how fast you're climbing. All right, we're cruising pretty nicely here. I'm going to go ahead and reduce speed. Just a teeny tiny bit more. Again, I don't want to do anything too crazy here. I want to kind of just line myself up nice and gently. All right. Our pattern speed is going to be pretty much anything in the white. Generally, I like to keep it right around 70 knots with one notch of flaps in. So that way, when I do begin my final descent, I can put that last notch of flaps in and go ahead and gently come down on my own. This thing is pretty lightweight. It's just not very aerodynamic. So it's not going to have the greatest acceleration. All right, about 1,000 feet. I feel like I'm going downhill here, but that's because of my view. And pull the nose up just a teeny tiny bit. Delightful. Okay, that should be about over the end of the runway, like I planned. I'm going to go ahead and put that first notch of flaps in. I am under 76 knots. Don't put the water rudder down. Don't be that guy. Friends don't let friends put the water rudder down. All right, there's my lovely little runway. Again, you want to be doing about 65, 70 knots in the pattern here. Again, if there's heavy traffic, you're not going to be able to get away with anything like that. There we go. Go ahead and flip on that little handy dandy landing light to let everybody know you're about to put this thing down. Again, you don't need the landing light technically unless it's nighttime, but landing lights are kind of nice ways to kind of get everybody knowing where you are. All right, looking at ourselves pretty darn good. I'm gonna again reduce that speed. I'm starting to get outside of the safe zone for the flaps. Looks good. Go ahead and put down my landing gear. Go ahead and drop my notch of flaps. And we're just gonna go ahead and do a nice gentle descent. And then we're gonna come spin around to a very, very tight left base for a runway. That runway, the wind was just a little bit stronger than I had anticipated. By the way, the uh, GPS on here does support flight plans. If you wanted to, you could actually do a flight plan. You could do a particular origin if you wanted to. We can come in here and say, let's say, uh, from where we took off from KOXB. Press enter, and let's say we want to fly up to JFK for whatever reason come in here and say KJFK and press enter and whoop, now I've got a flight plan. That's all there really is to it. All right, our approach speed is gonna be right around 55 knots, but we're actually gonna be using the lift reserve in order to help us with that a little bit today. Keep your hand on that throttle. Interesting fact, uh, this whole island that I'm flying over right now is basically has tremendous amounts of wild horses on it. It's actually really cool. I'm sure they would not appreciate us flying over the top of their heads at this time. But that's perfectly fine. All right, line ourselves up with the runway. Double check to make sure everything's ready. Gumfuls, gas undercarriage, make sure propeller flaps light speed. We are good to go. Okay, get yourselves to about 55 knots. And now it's going to be time to look at that lift reserve needle. You see how when I pull back, you've got that little dash green line that's right about there. That's considered your best speed for landing. So you can see right now, that's getting me about 58, 59 knots. You want to avoid going too slow. Right now you can see I'm going a little fast because that needle is just slightly low. There it is, right there. That's perfect, about 48, 49 knots. It's going to get me coming down at the absolute optimum speed and optimum angle of attack for a successful landing. Again, you still have to land the plane. That doesn't change anything, but at least it makes it easy to figure out what speed. Yeah, I came in just a touch high here. Again, with aircraft like this, it's almost easier to go ahead and do a nice and safe numbers landing versus a target threshold landing. Go ahead and set myself up the big old number 32. We've got a pretty good crosswind, but that's anticipated. Kill the throttle. We're just going to kind of hover. Again, you want to be so ginger with these back tires. Ginger. Ginger. The word is ginger. Oh, okay. That was pretty ginger. Easy, 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 easy. We did it. <laughs> Not bad. All right, hopefully you found this video helpful. Again, uh, this is a pretty cool plane. I don't find myself flying it very much because it's just a little bit too slow for me. But if you're looking for something to explore rivers and lakes in kind of an efficient fashion, this is definitely a solid choice. Enjoy.